make the grand hand. So I think um, God gives everybody gifts and abilities and talents and then also um, like drive and motivation. And so literally all, my whole goal is just to take like the gifts and the abilities that God has given me and use them to build the kingdom. Um, and so I can, you know, build stuff. And so I love uh, mission trips, especially ones where we get to work. Um, I love hard work. I love sweat. I love just, you know, really, really just kind of digging in and getting dirty and, and, uh, and doing some really cool stuff. Um, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day of construction, you know, after 10, 12 hours, there's something there that wasn't there in the morning. Um, and so just on that level, it's really, really cool. And then when you can do that, and there's like um, eternal significance to that, I mean, that just makes a huge, huge difference. And so, you know, who knows, maybe somebody reads or sees this and it inspires them to do something, um, to maybe take a step that they've never done before. Um, and to, uh, you know, really maybe consider what they could do. You know, what what are their gifts and abilities? What are they passionate about? And then how does that fit in with what Brookside does and, and reach in the city? And then really just, you know, changing people's lives. Well, it is good to see you today in all the ways you're joining in, whether that's online, at our Correction Center campus, mods 4, 7, 8, and 13, uh, at Elkhorn and at Millard. Again, good to see you. Well, a few years ago, my family did an extended vacation where we did this, this family reunion with a bunch of my dad's side of the family up near Grand Rapids, uh, not too far away from Lake Michigan. And one of the things that's true about this area that, that I'd actually forgotten about was that there are like miles and miles and miles of sand dunes in that area. And so we took a half day during the reunion to go do like a dune buggy tour of the sand, uh, of the sand dunes. And then there was also this lighthouse where we were able to get out, tour the lighthouse, and then play around a little bit, walk around on the sand dunes. And one of the things that we all know is true about sand is that it's really fun to play and really fun to run down, but it is a lot of work to climb a sand dune. I mean, you, you take a step forward, you plant your foot, you dig in, and instead of climbing uphill, you slide about three quarters of the way back down. It is two steps forward, one step back. And this is the way a lot of life can feel sometimes, isn't it? Two steps forward, one step back especially in these areas of life that we know need attention, that we want to change. I mean, maybe for you, you're fighting for your marriage or for a healthy relationship with your adult or teenage kids. Maybe the goal is to, is to lose weight, to, to break an unhealthy habit, to establish good money patterns, or, or to start reading the Bible more often. And, and these are all good things. You're, you're trying to climb the hill, but it feels like two steps forward one step back, or sometimes even two steps forward, three steps back. And so, so the question I want to ask us this morning in these situations that all of us can relate to is, is how do I keep moving forward in these situations that I know need attention, where change is hard, but, but I know change is worthwhile, how do I move forward in these situations when life gets hard, when I hit a, a, a big one step back situation? What keeps me focused? What offers motivation? Uh, how is there still hope? What keeps me moving forward when life gets hard? Well, I think this is, this is similar or close to the question Nehemiah is asking in Nehemiah chapter 13, where we find this big one step back moment, which catches us off guard based on everything we've seen in the book so far, because so far, the book has been all about progress. I mean, the book starts out with Nehemiah. He's in the royal court of Persia, and he learns about the destroyed walls around Jerusalem. He learns about the desperate state of his people. And so Nehemiah, he develops this like deep burden in the deepest parts of himself to go address the situation. And so, so God works in amazing ways allowing Nehemiah this extended leave of absence away from his post in Persia. God works. He resources Nehemiah with what he needs to build the wall back in Jerusalem. And so right out of the chute, there are all sorts of clear indicators of progress. Things are moving up and to the right. And then construction on the wall starts with tremendous all-hands-on-deck unity. And then construction continues through significant opposition 
from these two guys, Sanballat and Tobiah. And in 52 days, even despite this opposition, in 52 days, the wall gets rebuilt. I mean, that's clearly progress. And then the forward momentum continues as the people resettle into the city. The word of God is opened and read in chapter 8, and the people respond in all of the right ways. Chapter 10 is actually all about this formal recommitment ceremony. So all of this, clear progress in the right direction. And then chapters 11 and 12, they're the icing on the cake where there's this city-wide celebration that is full of joy and thanksgiving. The wall has been rebuilt. The people have been renewed. The book has been pretty much about nothing but progress. Change has happened. And we really wish Nehemiah ended at the end of chapter 12. But Nehemiah doesn't end with chapter 12. Instead, we get to chapter 13, where there's the big step back moment. That the wheels fall off. It's hard to watch. I mean, we want to skip over it, just move into what's next. But, but here's why taking some time to look at Nehemiah 13 is so valuable for us today. It's valuable because we need to see that the Bible isn't sugar-coated. That the same mess that we experience in our own lives is the same mess that we read about in the Bible. It relates that way. I mean, this, this drives home the genuine history of the Bible. The Bible isn't trying to gloss over anything. It's not trying to deceitfully manipulate details. Instead, this reinforces that this is a true book. It actually tells us what happened. And then, then another reason this is valuable is because Nehemiah's response, his pursuit of God-honoring change, even in the midst of this ginormous one-step-back situation, Nehemiah's response shows us how to keep climbing the sand dune, how to keep persevering even in life's most difficult, desperate, one-step-back situations. How do I keep moving forward when life gets hard? Listen in today, and by the time we're done, you will leave here with determination, and hope. And just imagine what a fresh infusion of those things will do in whatever desperate situation you're facing right now, whatever is in front of you this week. Or even if you're not facing anything right now, we all know we're never too far away from those situations. Imagine what a fresh infusion of determination and hope can do in your own situation. And so let's dig in. This is a long chapter. So we're actually going to take a couple of passes over it. To start with, I'm going to highlight some verses that help us feel that the big step back situation that Nehemiah is up against. All the way things are going in the wrong direction. And we're going to spend some time on this. Just because I want us to get, this isn't just a small thing. This isn't just like, oh yeah, we'll get around to it when we get around to it. I, I want us to see that everything that Nehemiah had worked for has gotten unraveled. The situation isn't just a one big step back moment. It's, it's desperate. But then we're going to swing back around through the passage, and we're going to see how Nehemiah responds to this. Nehemiah pursues lasting change. He keeps at it. He perseveres through decisive and intentional action, and he perseveres with, with persistent hope. So let's get a feel now for this one big step back situation that faces Nehemiah in chapter 13. So chapter 13 starts off with, with this high note, verses 1 to 3. O obedience by the people, where they bring their lives into conformity with God's word. But early in the chapter, verse 4, is where the wheels start to fall off. That's where we'll start reading. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 4 says, Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storeroom of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. And he provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. So that name Tobiah, it maybe sounds familiar to you. 
I mean, he was one of the major opponents earlier in the book. But now in what we just read there in verses 4 and 5, the priest, Eliashib, give this opponent, Tobiah, space in the temple, which in turn has this ripple effect of interrupting and crowding out the normal operations and rhythms of the temple. And so this is big. I mean, back in the day, it'd be like Tom Osborne letting Barry Switzer have the Huskers practice field and the weight room on the week leading up to the big Nebraska-Oklahoma game, and then not letting the Huskers themselves in those spaces. This is big. I mean, it's not just backwards and confusing and head-scratching. What Eliashib does here is blasphemy. It, it, is, it is the wheels falling off at the most fundamental level. It's betrayal is what it is. Or jump down to verse 10. We keep reading, we say that, we, we read that, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites hadn't been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service of the temple had gone back to their own fields. And so here are the temple servants that should have been supported by the people. They hadn't gotten what they need. And so they need to eat, right? And so they're forced to leave their posts in temple worship and to go back to their own fields away from the temple area to provide for themselves. And so the stinginess of the people is stifling the spiritual life of the community. This is big. Let's keep looking at this. Verse 15, in those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. And that now there is no way for me to overstate how big of a deal Sabbath observance was in the Old Testament. It was this defining feature of God's people. It helped on this weekly drumbeat. It helped anchor them in dependence on God and God-centeredness. And we see the seriousness of them desecrating the Sabbath in verse 17. Nehemiah, he confronts the people. He says, what is this wicked thing you're doing? This isn't morally neutral. He says, what is this wicked thing that you're doing? Desecrating the Sabbath day. Didn't your ancestors do the same thing so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? And now you're stirring up more wrath. You're just inviting the same consequences against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. And so they are repeating. They're cycling back through the same, the, same, the same actions that warranted God's judgment earlier in their history. Again, just underlining the serious state that the people are in in Nehemiah chapter 13. Verse 23, let's keep going. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, all these foreign places outside of Israel, Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples. And then listen to this. And they didn't know how to speak the language of Judah. A few weeks ago when we looked at chapter 10, we saw that this issue with foreign marriages, it wasn't about race. It was about religion. These marriages were diminishing and they were polluting the worship of the one true God, Yahweh, by introducing all of these other foreign gods into the community. And then what's up with these other kids speaking other languages in verse 24? Well, the big deal, the big deal here isn't simply the presence of another language. Because like most other places around the world throughout history, they were probably multilingual themselves. Instead, the issue here is how verse 24 ends. They didn't know the language of Judah. And if they didn't know Hebrew, they couldn't know the scriptures. Derek Kidner, in one of his commentaries on Nehemiah, he says this. He says, the different languages among the children, it wasn't only a symptom, but a threat. It meant a steady erosion of Israelite identity at the level of all thinking and expression. That's what's at stake here. And a loss of access to the word of God, which would effectively paganize them. Then listen to this. A single generation's compromise could undo the work of centuries. That's what Nehemiah is up against in chapter 13. And then one more, there's Nehemiah 
chapter 13, verse 28, one of the sons of Joiada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. And so alongside Tobiah, who we already saw, Sanballat is the bad guy in the book of Nehemiah. And so when Sanballat's daughter marries the high priest's granddaughter, alarm bells should be going off as we read through Nehemiah. Things are bad at the highest levels of religious leadership. All right, so all of that, now let's bring it back together. That's been just summarizing and building this case that things are really bad in Nehemiah chapter 13. This is a systematic and complete unraveling of everything Nehemiah had worked for prior to that when he was in Jerusalem. This is more than a step back. The situation is desperate, is what Nehemiah is facing. So let's pause now and let's just, let's personalize this for a second. Are, are, there, are, are there ways your own situation feels desperate, that you can relate in some way to the wheels falling off, to, to things feeling like it's two steps forward, one step back, or two steps forward, ten steps back in your own situation? Maybe you are sitting in a mod at the correction center and you are wondering, how did I get here? How do I move forward? Maybe everything looks really good superficially on your life, in your life, but, but a secret sin of yours has been found out and all you feel on the inside is guilt and shame. And natural consequences are just going to start playing out in your life. Maybe you're a teenager who feels isolated and alone and misunderstood even when you are surrounded by people. Maybe you can't find work. Maybe, you're, maybe your marriage is hanging by a thread. Maybe you are in a desperate situation because of decisions you brought on yourself. Maybe you're in a desperate situation because of circumstances 100% outside of your control. What we need to see here in Nehemiah 13, why this is valuable, the Bible gets desperate situations. God gets desperate situations. He doesn't put this veneer over those things and say, let's just move past that. God gets desperate situations. All right, so let's go back to Nehemiah 13. While all of this is going on in Jerusalem, Nehemiah is absent. He's back in the city of Persia. This is what it says back in verses 6 and 7 of Nehemiah 13. But while all this is going on, Nehemiah says, I wasn't in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. And sometime later, I asked his permission, came back to Jerusalem, and here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the court of the house of God and everything else we just looked at in Nehemiah 13. And so here's a snapshot of the timeline in Nehemiah 13. When Nehemiah first leaves to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem in chapter 2, he took a leave of absence from the royal court of Persia that lasted about 12 years. That is some leave of absence. But then things get on track in Jerusalem. All the progress that we saw throughout the course of the book, the walls get rebuilt, the people get renewed. And so to honor his agreement with the king, Nehemiah leaves Jerusalem, he goes back to Persia, which, which just says a ton about Nehemiah's integrity and his faithfulness. Now, we don't know for sure how long Nehemiah was back in Persia. Some people say maybe as, as short as six to nine months. Some people say maybe as long as a decade or so. But whatever it was exactly, Nehemiah is gone for long enough for the situation to deteriorate in all the ways that we've seen in chapter 13. And what I'm so grateful for as we keep tracking through Nehemiah is that when Nehemiah hears about this situation, the wheels falling off, the, the big step back, when he hears about this in Nehemiah 13, he doesn't retreat, he doesn't go passive, he doesn't pull the covers back over his head and go back to sleep just to sleep it off. He doesn't wait for somebody else to step in and address things and just leave it up to them because I did my part and now it's their turn. It's not what Nehemiah does. Nehemiah rolls up his sleeves. He steps in 
and he presses forward. He responds. I'm sure it wasn't easy. I mean, just think about a leader who sees everything that he'd worked for unravel. I'm sure that hit Nehemiah like this punch in the gut over and over and over. And he's like, I hope it's a nightmare. I hope it's a nightmare. But it wasn't. The, the, wheels, the, the wheels really did fall off. I'm sure it wasn't easy. But it was right. And so Nehemiah does it. And, and I hope what we see in Nehemiah 13 gives you determination and a picture of what's right to respond well, to respond faithfully in desperate situations, one big step back situations in your life. So now let's take a swing back to the passage. How does Nehemiah respond? How do we respond to these one step back situations in our lives? One way is that we respond with decisive and intentional action. When Nehemiah learns that the enemy Tobiah had been given space in the temple, he starts throwing furniture around. Literally, he starts throwing furniture around. Verses 8 and 9, Nehemiah says, I was greatly displeased when he heard that, Nehemiah, or that Tobiah had gotten space in the temple. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. Or further down, when, when Nehemiah learns that the priests hadn't been supported when they'd left to go back to their fields, verse 11 says, So I rebuked the officials and asked them, Why is the house of God neglected? And then I called them together and stationed them, the, the, the temple servants, at their posts. And so walk through this chapter line by line. And whenever Nehemiah sees a way compromise or disobedience has crept in, he addresses it decisively, specifically, and intentionally. Point by point, issue by issue. And it's strong and dramatic. I mean, verse 25, we find Nehemiah, he's physically confronting the people. He's pulling out people's hair. He, he's verbally calling down curses from heaven on them. And that's one of those verses that's worth slowing down on because we're like, what is up with that? Well, to start to understand what's going on there, we need to remember that the Old Testament nation, Israel, was a theocracy something we are not, nor should we be a theocracy since the coming of Jesus has redefined the way God's kingdom should be understood. But in a theocracy, the king and the civic leaders, they rule for and under God in very specific ways in, a, in an earthly kingdom. Now remember that Nehemiah, he had been governor of this theocratic kingdom. He'd been the governor of Jerusalem, and so as a civic leader... Nehemiah's not on a, on a personal vendetta here. He's not carrying out vig, vigilante justice. He's carrying out discipline that was actually likely even softer than the discipline that could have been warranted in Old, in Old Testament law, which perhaps even said some of these things should have been worthy of stoning. But the bottom line not to miss is that Nehemiah, in, in all of this, in all these specific, decisive, intentional ways he's responding, Nehemiah is passionate about holiness. Nehemiah is passionate about confronting sin. They just, they just can't live together side by side with holiness. So here's the question for us. Are, are we, are, are you, am I, are we as passionate about addressing and confronting sin in our own lives, about pursuing holiness in decisive and intentional ways in the areas of our life that we just know need attention, where we know there are gaps. When I was in high school, a close friend of mine named Nick, he trusted Jesus, began following him, but some bad habits, some sinful patterns, they, they carried forward with Nick into college, especially partying and drinking. And God convicted the, uh, Nick of these things over time. And Nick knew he needed to do something intentional to, to address this, this sin and just to move in a different direction. And so, so what Nick did was genius. He wrote this email to his friends that was worded so carefully. He, he didn't break off any relationships. 
He expressed gratitude for the friendships. He expressed this desire that they'd find healthy ways to continue. But just as carefully, Nick communicated his faith in Jesus that was just leading him to create different patterns in his life. And he, and he communicated carefully there would be boundaries in his own life that would protect him from the things that he knew were derailing his faith. So that's Nick. We've seen what Nehemiah does. How about you? How do you need to address sin and pursue holiness in your own life? But there's more. What else do we see in Nehemiah 13 about how to respond in desperate situations? These one big step back moments. So we respond with decisive and intentional action. We also respond in persistent hope. Four times in this one chapter, chapter 13, which is a lot, by the way, four times we see Nehemiah punctuating the flow of the storyline with these remember statements that I'll show us here in a second. And if you have your Bibles open, if, I encourage you to highlight or underline these words remember, because that just helps us see how often they come out in the text. Verse 14 says, remember me the, for this, my God, and don't blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God in its services. Verse 22, remember me for this also, my God. Show mercy to me according to your great love. Verse 25, remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. And then verses, uh, verse 31, the, the very last words in the book. Here's how Nehemiah ends. Remember me with favor, my God. And so in the midst of this desperate situation, Nehemiah is depending on God. In the midst of this one big step back moment, Nehemiah prays is what he's doing in each of these. Now, just like you, I've talked with lots of people who didn't feel like, well, like they were in desperate situations. They felt like they were in hopeless situations. And at least in my experience, with these people that I have in mind, one thing that marked their hopelessness alongside everything else was that they stopped praying. People who have given up on hope stop praying. Don't miss, though, that with as difficult as his situation is in Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah keeps praying He's still looking to God and trusting God to act. Nehemiah moves forward into all that he faces in Nehemiah 13. He moves forward in persistent hope. A lot of you know that I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. Um, like at least uh, once a quarter, maybe, maybe not quite that often, but like, okay, boys, we're watching the Lord of the Rings again. Like, hey, guys, have you read the Lord of the Rings? How's the Cimmerillion going? Uh, but but in, this, in this final book of the trilogy, The Return of the King, the heroes Frodo and Sam, they're in Mordor. They're almost to Mount Doom to destroy the ring. And their situation is desperate. There is zero reason for hope in the storyline. But then listen to this excerpt. There, peeping through the clouds high in the sky, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart and as he looked up out of the forsaken land, out of his own desperate situation, he looked up out of the forsaken land and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end, listen to this, that in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing. And there was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Brookside, listen to me. For followers of Jesus, there is always reason for hope. A hope that is forever beyond the reach of the desperate situations that we all face in our own lives. I mean, this is what Jesus offers. Jesus offers the hope of new life, of a renewed identity, the community of the local church, the promise of eternal life in his presence. Only in Jesus do we find this hope and strength and the motivation and the source of power to keep climbing the sand dune. One step forward, half a step back. One step forward, half a step back. 
But Jesus, the, the life that he gives, the life that changes us from the inside out, it gives us the power, the motivation to keep moving forward in a way that honors him, even in life's toughest situations. We can truly experience that hope now in this life. It doesn't mean everything is going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we still won't have desperate situations. It won't mean that we're never one phone call away from a one big step back moment. But it doesn't change the the equally true truth that Jesus offers new life and sure hope. These keep us looking to God and trusting to him. And so we move forward in persistent hope. And then one day this hope anticipated will be hope realized. That's the future the Bible promises. The realization of your identity in Christ. I mean, just imagine the full realization of our identity in Christ. Perfect communion with God and with others. The joy of a world that is unpolluted by sin and brokenness. Our hope in these things is not some boy, I hope so, sort of hope. Because of what Jesus accomplished in his death and in his resurrection, when the Bible uses the word hope, we should just substitute confident assurance in that space. Because of what Jesus has done, what he's accomplished, the hope he offers us is sure. And so even in our most desperate situations, we move forward with hope. And so so in what situation in your life right now, do you need to come back to center on on the sure hope that Jesus offers? Well, the situation in Nehemiah 13 is desperate. And and Nehemiah enters into this desperate situation at tremendous cost to himself. But the sad news is, even Nehemiah can't fix it. As, As the story of the Bible continues to unfold, The changes that Nehemiah makes, none of them last. Fast forward 450 years, we get to the first century, the time of the New Testament, and the situation had deteriorated again. There's division, misplaced priorities. There's external obedience with zero heart engagement. There's conflict, there's fear, there's idolatry. The book of Nehemiah itself teaches us We need a better Nehemiah. And then the good news that the Christianity tells us, the good news the the Bible tells, is that we have a better Nehemiah in Jesus Christ. Jesus enters a desperate situation that makes Nehemiah 13 pale in comparison. Jesus enters into a situation where his creation has rebelled and resisted against him. That's you and that's me. We have rebelled and resisted him in all sorts of subtle, creative, inventive, and selfish ways. The Bible says we are enemies of God. We, we, we are by nature children of wrath who deserve his judgment. The situation is desperate. And Jesus willingly enters into this situation at the greatest cost to himself. He dies on the cross for our sins in our place. He rises to to life on the third day. He offers new life and true life to anyone who would confess their sins, place their faith in him, and then follow him as Savior and Lord. So as we wrap up the book of Nehemiah, Let's follow where Nehemiah points us. How do I keep moving forward when life gets hard? We look to Jesus. And by now you see that that's not just some trite cliche. It's a true statement. We need Jesus. Our situation is desperate without him. And then the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is there. He's done for us. He's done for you what you could never do for yourself. And so we cling to Jesus. We persevere through hard times. We we keep going through one step back moments as we cling to the better Nehemiah. Jesus is the one who's building something great. 
we get to be a part of it. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that, that in, a, in a chapter that seems so desperate and so hopeless, there is great reason for hope. There is, there is reason for determination and perseverance. But Jesus, the way I want to pray right now is just, is just to center us again on the hope that you offer because of what you've done for us on the cross. Jesus, there is none like you. May that drive us to the better Nehemiah. May that drive us to you in fresh worship and obedience and mission. Amen.